Please have a seat, taking you to the book of Genesis, chapter 19 this morning, and verses 1 through 14. Genesis chapter 19 and verses 1 through 14. And this is the last time, well, I shouldn't say the last time, we are finishing up the Ten Commandments as far as our question of the month is concerned. And so, just so you don't forget, we're just going to run through the Ten real quick, because you are so astute as students of the word, I know you already know these things. So, commandment number one, don't have any gods before me. You can have other joys in life, but don't have any other joys in front of my face. Let me be your first love, and you will really know my love. So, no other gods before me. Don't make any graven images. Don't make me like you. Because God says I'm not like you. I'm way beyond I am transcendent, and yet I became like you, so you could become like my son. Third commandment. Don't take my name in vain. My name is wonderful. My name is holy. My name is great. I'm the Lord. And keep the Sabbath day holy. Would you please just let your soul rest on my presence once a week, gather together with the people of God? Just, just come and enjoy the moment together. Keep the Sabbath holy. And preserve life, don't murder. Preserve life with all you got. And don't commit adultery, either in your heart or in your mind or with your body. Be faithful in your promises. And don't steal. Don't take what's not yours. Preserve other people's property. Yeah, it's a good one. And then, don't bear false witness. Be a person of truth. Your yeses be yes and your noes be noes. And then finally, the tenth commandment, which is today, which is the tenth commandment. Don't covet. Learn contentment. The rare jewel, as Jeremiah Burroughs, the Puritan, would say, the rare jewel of Christian contentment. And those are the Ten Commandments. See how well you did? You sat there so spellbound because you know those things in your heart. Well, let's go to the book. and uh, It's an interesting chapter. I'm going I'm to try to make it encouraging. Um, but sometimes the Bible's the Bible, right? God's Word's smarter than me, so we'll go with what God has to say this morning. Uh, this is a... Uh, the story of Sodom and our studies have been kind of going through Genesis. So here we go, first 14 verses of chapter 19. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may arise early. And go your way, get out of here. They said, however, no, but we will spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread. And they ate before they lay down. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relationships with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him. And he said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with a man. Please let them bring them out to, to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men, inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came as an alien, and already he's acting like a judge. Now we treat you worse than, the, than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. And when the two men said to Lot, whom else do you have here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry has become great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, Up! Get out of this place! For the Lord will destroy the city! But he appeared to his sons-in-law as to be jesting. 
That's the word of God. Let's pray. God, give us wisdom in the word and help us to understand what it means today. And may we not forget the wonderful grace you've given us that we have sought refuge in you, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. I borrowed, I borrowed the title of the sermon from a sermon of Jonathan Edwards on the same text. I guess I can give it back to him, can I? Is that all right? I borrowed, I can give it back to him. You know, Edwards is that preacher in Northampton, Mass., 1700s, saw a great awakening take place in his church, and then Whitfield came a few years later. Another great awakening was wonderful. Edwards was uh, the late Harvard professor. Harvey uh, Perry Miller said he was the greatest gift mentally given to the people of America. Um, and, and Mr. Perry Miller was not even a Christian. But he, Edwards had a gift of taking the lowly things of the earth and making spiritual application. And uh, he would take things from the lower world and picture things from the upper world, as I guess I'm trying to say. And I used it in my Sunday school class this morning. He talked about sin like being a cat. You have a cat in your house? Have you ever watched a cat toy with a mouse and play with the mouse and then pretend it's not going to take it and the mouse thinks it's going to get away and then Row! and tortures it and lets it go for a little while and pretends it's not. And Edward said that's what sin does to us. And so I'm going to try to use a couple of illustrations here that kind of may hopefully picture some lower world realities that kind of picture the upper world. It happened at least three times to me. The last time it happened, we were in the North Shore Mall. My wife and I are walkers. We walk the mall, exercise. We are walking, doing our thing one afternoon, and uh, the alarm went off. The fire alarm. I mean, really loud, obnoxious, really, really aggravating, you know. And when the alarm went off, you know what happened? Nothing. Nice dress in the window there, nice shoes. No one moved. Everybody did their thing. We were at Border Cafe several years ago, having lunch together. And the alarm went off. I mean, loud. You couldn't even talk to each other. You know what we did? More chips, salsa. I mean, nobody moved. I mean, nobody moved. Years ago, when I was younger, I was at the Y down in Lynn here with my, my daughter used to go, Andrea and I, we'd work out together. And uh, this time she wasn't with me. And there we were working out, a bunch of us people. And I didn't realize this at the Y, that there was this unwritten rule. that If, it's, if there's a towel within 10 yards of a machine, that means somebody's using that machine. I didn't realize that, but I found out really quickly from a very angry woman that I took her machine, but we'll figure that out later. But there I was on the, the preacher's curl. I don't know why they call it the preacher's curl, but for some odd reason I was drawn to it. <laughs> huh? I can't cheat on it, that's right. You can't cheat is right. And uh, we were working out. They, I, they used to play Magic 106.7 on the radio. I don't know if that's even the station anymore, but anyways. And we were, at, we're all working out, and all of a sudden the alarm goes off. I mean, it's loud. Everyone knows what the alarm's for. It's warning us. There's, there's a fire. Run! And what do we do? No one's moving. And, and, and if you were to ask the people, why, did, why didn't you get up and run? Well, the alarm's gone off before and nothing's happened. None of the important people were running away from the building. None of the, the patrons or none of the, none of the staff were running away. So why should we? And by the way, I didn't see any smoke. I didn't smell any smoke, so why should I run? Well, actually, that time, someone in the living quarters of the Y had left their little stove on, and they had set their alarm off, and so there actually was a fire at that moment. It's kind of like the gospel. The, the message of Christianity kind of goes out sometimes, and part of it is warning. It's not all love, by the way. John the Baptist, repent, you know, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Same with Jesus. And the warning goes out, and I think sometimes people give the same reason for, for thinking that the words are kind of in jest. Well, I've heard this before, but nothing's really ever happened. I've heard the warning. I, I, I can't see it with my eyes. And the real, the, real, the real movers and shakers of our world, they're not moving. They're not running. So why, why should we come? Why should we listen to the warning? Well, in Genesis... We've been following some people. There's, there's people and there's a plot happening. And two of the people that we've got to meet are, are Abraham and Lot. Now, a, a major flood has taken place in Genesis. It's granted a great cleansing of the, of the planet from God's perspective. But there's still sin in the heart, unfortunately. And one of the survivors of the flood, his name is Shem. He's a flood survivor, one of the eight. 
And God has given promise to Shem. Shem, from you, uh, the God of glory will be praised. And from you, one will come, Shem. The line that was promised from Eve is going to go through you and out to Abraham. And Shem, it's going to be a blessing to the world, the seed. And we need that seed to come fix our world. If you've got any vision of the Kavanaugh hearings, you, you, you got a picture of why we need the, the Christ, right? I mean, that's a circus going on. I don't care what side you land on. It's not good, okay? It doesn't matter where you land. Be objective, step back and think, oh man, the promise needs to be here. And that the promise is going to come through Shem. Now, Shem, one of the Shemites um, who survives the flood, he has um, some family, Abraham and Lot. You need to understand something about, about Shem, though. Shem lives 500 years after the flood. 500. He was 100 when the flood hit. He lives 500 years afterwards. So our story here is taking place probably two to 300 years plus after the flood. Shem's still alive. So that means that Shem, one of the flood survivors, could have met Abraham and Lot. Shem lived 100 years before the flood. That means he could have known Methuselah, who died the year of the flood. Methuselah knew somebody named Adam, who was the first created individual. See how it all connects? How easily these stories could have been passed on without the written record? Obviously. Now, these two Shemites, Abraham and Lot, they've split up. And Lot has gone to a place near Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, some angels have come. And it's really, it's really strange because the story is building and building and building. And we're waiting for this, this seed to come, this, this child who's going to kind of take care of all the, the, the recklessness of humanity and take care of all the confusion. And then God gives us this story. And the angels come to Abraham and they ask the question, should we tell Abraham what we're going to go do? Should we tell him? And so they tell him, and Abraham begins to intercede for the, for the righteous ones in Sodom. And so the angels come down, and they come to Lot's house, or Lot sees them at the gate, he bows down. And when Lot tells his sons-in-law what's about to happen, it appears to them like he's just playing them. He's just joking around. He's just jesting. That, that's not going to happen. And I'm telling you, they, it was right there, right on the cusp of being destroyed. And yet they, they didn't believe. They didn't see. They didn't take his thoughts seriously. And you're like, oh, please listen. This is what's going to happen. And they, they don't hear. Now, my question this morning is this. Well, the doctrine is basically this. Gospel warnings are not listened to because they seem unreal to the lost. They just seem unreal. That that could not happen. My question is, why do they seem unreal? Well, theologically we know why. Because the Bible says that the gospel, the message of Christianity, is foolishness to those who are perishing. They don't hear it. They don't hear it in their heart. They may hear the noise in their ears rattling around, but it doesn't reach their soul. We know without the Spirit of God they cannot receive the things of the Spirit, which is of the Word. But I want to look at this more practically speaking. Why didn't they receive it? Have you ever sat in a mall and just gone mall watching? I mean, all the people rushing by, and then you're meditating on the things of God in your mind and your heart. And you realize that people are leaving the planet every day. Every day facing their eternal reality. Every day. By the thousands. And you watch these people in the, in, in the, in the, in the mall and you're like, does anybody understand this? Does anybody know that to leave the world without Christ the Lord is to enter into eternal damnation? But to leave the planet with Christ is to enter into eternal glory? And you wonder that only a few that find it. And so you're thinking, watching them go through their day. And they're so caught up with so many trivial things. And you wonder why, why don't they hear? Why don't they listen? How come they're not coming to the one who can save their soul? who can breathe life into their dead spirits and rise them up so one day when they leave the planet, they will know forever their Creator in the places called glory and paradise. Why don't they listen? 
Well, maybe we can draw some conclusions here. Maybe because past warnings seem to be false alarms in the hearers of, or the ears of, Lot's sons-in-law. He comes and it says in verse 9, the people at the door say, this one came in as an alien and is already acting like a judge. Literally speaking, Kyle and Dalich say, is always wanting to play the judge. In other words, if you were looking at this in the Greek language, it would be in the present tense. In fact, in the Septuagint, it is actually in the present tense. That this one who has come as an alien, he keeps on judging us. He keeps on talking about these things, but nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. He keeps telling us to be careful. Stop doing that. Because, and nothing really ever takes place. I'm not saying that Lot was like the moral police or something, but these things vexed his heart. And it's hard to understand that the New Testament says righteous Lot. And you think, man, he struggled big time. Yeah, he might have, but he's righteous Lot. And these things tormented his soul. And so if they tormented his soul, he would speak them out. And they said, well, we've heard Lot speak before, but nothing's really ever happened. We've been at the YMCA before and the alarm's gone off and nothing's ever happened. So why should we panic? Why should we run? Why should we flee? Because, you know, we've heard these warnings before and nothing's really ever taken place. It's sort of like those winter winds upon the soul, December. Jan it's coming, by the way. January, February. And those cold, cold, winter, sinful winds, they freeze the water of the pond and the lake, and they become hard. And like those freezing unbelief, those winds of unbelief, they go over the surface of the soul, and they don't hear. They don't listen. And so the words of Lot in the ears of his sons-in-law, they seem to be foolishness. He just seemed to be jesting. We've heard all these warnings before, and nothing has ever happened. You know, this isn't God not coming through, holding up his end of the bargain. This is God's incredible patience. That he's great in mercy. He's a God of wonders. And it's amazing what God himself, in his divine being, and all his perfections, how he, as God, is rich in mercy. I mean, he is rich in mercy. So it's not as if God is not, you know, loving and kind here, but the warning has gone out. God is full of mercy. He is full of compassion. He is full of glory. Think of the days of Noah. Noah's building the ark. And the ark took how many years to build? A hundred. A hundred plus. Every stroke of the hammer was like, come on, Noah. Another day's gone by, nothing's happened. Every piece of gopher wood on the... Noah, nothing's happening. Nothing's really going to happen. Noah, and they didn't believe, possibly because past warnings did not come to be in regard to reality. They did not see what the warnings declared. For a hundred years there was verbal testimony, uh, visual testimony, practical testimony, but nothing impacted their hearts. Ecclesiastes says this, because the sentence against evil is not executed quickly, the sons of men are full of evil. Because the sentence against evil is not executed quickly. The sons of men, they are full of evil. They think it's jestful because, oh, you know, we've heard these things before. He's been a judge all this time, and nothing's happened. And so, therefore, it's not going to happen. But did it happen? Yeah, it did. It did happen. Secondly, maybe they thought this. Unless we see it with our own eyes, we're not going to believe we're just not going to believe. By the way, that's a problem because biblical saving faith is the conviction of things not seen. Even if I do see it, I'm still not going to come. They kept asking Jesus over and over for a sign. Give us a sign, then we'll believe. How many signs do you have to have? I mean, the blind man in John chapter 9 being interrogated during the Pharisaical Inquisition, you know, and basically he says to them, listen, the blind man who's now can see, you don't also want to believe in him also because we have never ever heard 
We have never ever heard this to be that someone who was born blind could be healed. There is no way that this man is not from God. You want a sign, there you go. The blind man can see. Lazarus, come forth. Come forth, Lazarus. And there he comes with his grave clothes on, dragging behind him, and he's alive. Little girl, Talitha Kumi. Little girl, arise. You want a sign? There's lots of signs. But they still didn't believe, did they? So even if they could see, they still wouldn't believe. Jesus tells that in that wonderful parable in the book of Luke, chapter 17. In the story, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man's crying out, Oh, please, make sure you send Lazarus to my brothers, because if he goes back, and he goes back from the dead, then my brothers will believe. And it's a parable. And Jesus says, They have Moses and the prophets. If they do not believe the written word of God, neither will they believe if God raises somebody from the dead. You ask for signs, Maybe these folks, these sons-in-laws of Lot, said, well, unless I see it, I'm not going to believe. That's not going to help. What you have to do is call out to God to give you faith. He'll hear you. Cry out to God. Say, God, fill my heart with belief. Help my unbelief. Fill my soul with the ability to understand, to see clearly, to hear you like never before. Cry out to him because they thought, they thought Lot was kidding around. Lot, you're just messing with us. You're playing us. This isn't going to happen. We don't have to run. Why should we flee? Are your senses always your best judge of reality? I don't think so. Why do we give such credit to them? Are they, is my personal sensory experience the best thing to interpret reality? No. Let's say you meet some nice, pleasant-looking person. They seem confident, and they're smiling. You think, this is a nice person. This is a good encounter. This is a good, a good time together. You know, not only do they look confident, and not only are they smiling at you, they say nice things to you. This is pleasant. And not only, but they have either good cologne, or they've got good per they, It even smells nice here. This is great. And, and they, they say wonderful things about you, and oh, this was a good encounter. But what you couldn't see, they were carrying the flu. And they shook your hand. And now you've touched your eye. You see, your sensory perception is not the best equator of reality. And so that's why we need an outward revelation from God to tell us what is true. God sends a lot to his sons-in-law. But they thought it was a joke. Oh, it's not going to happen. Because maybe they couldn't see it happening. That's why God says, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own, because he who trusts his own heart is a fool. And so they come and they hear the message from Lot, who's gotten the message from the angels, whom had talked to Abraham, and they don't believe that it's true. Jesus, once talking to his skeptics, said this, If you don't believe my words, at least believe, at least believe in my, my works. Not that they could open your eyes, but they should be able to open your eyes, but they don't. At least believe those things. Paul says to the Corinthians, we walk by faith, not by sense or sight. We walk by faith in what God has revealed to us in the Word. You know, a people, a people who are ruled by sensationalism, a people who are ruled by drama, uh, or dramatic you know, flair, a people who are moved by emotional rhetoric, and not by objective reality and the rule of law, are really going to have a hard time with the gospel. They really are. Because the first part of the gospel we must understand is this, and I know it sounds really preachy and like, you know, old-time Puritan, but that we're ungodly. We don't like to hear that, do we? No, but the wrath of God has been revealed, Paul says, against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. And you say, well, I'm not ungodly. Well, we've all ungodded God. All of us have. We, all, we make things more important than He is. It's not that other things can't be important, but they can't be more important than Him. And we do it. He's not our first love a lot of times. He's not my first love. I'm not, I'm not happy about that. But that's the first part of the Gospel. And if we live amongst a people who are just moved by their sensuality, like these men of the city, they're not going to hear the words. 
Because the first thing the gospel says is you need something outside of yourself to save you. And that is Jesus Christ the Lord. Now he's willing to have you. Isn't that amazing? That God calls. He calls. The effectual call to people. And when you're called, you know it. If you're called by God in Christ, you must come. There's no turning back. You must have him. You must. And then you know. These men, well, unless we see it, we're not, we're not going to come. Maybe that was the second practical reason. The third practical reason maybe was this. No one else seems alarmed. Notice that in verse 9 that Lot's considered an alien. He's not a mover and a shaker here in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's not one of the big cheeses. He's not the big kahuna. He's not the one who, you know, who gets to have the big house. He's not looked upon as one of the leaders. That, they're not running, so why should we run? None of the people who are influential in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah are hearing your, your word seriously. Imagine at the YMCA, if the alarm went off and I went out screaming, Ah, run! And no one else did. I'd look like a fool, an idiot. Why would I do that? No one else is running. I'm not going to act like an idiot. All the people who are working there, the staff weren't leaving. Everyone was just kind of working out. And no one's leaving a lot. You're an alien here, by the way. I, your words don't seem to, to be true. It seems almost to be a joke. You know, we live in a culture, you ever wonder why, I hate to pick on politicians, but I will. Um, some politicians, we'll say, not all of them. You ever a reason why they, 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 they bring celebrities in? to bolster their campaigns? Because they know our culture. They know that we as a people are moved by celebrities. So if you give the little pop princess the microphone in your hand, she's gotta be right, right? I mean, that Mecca known as Hollywood, they're always correct, correct? I mean, if, if, if they're saying something, you follow them all the way, right? No, not at all, because that's not, but you know, no one's running here, none of the important people are leaving. Why should we leave, Lot? We hear your message, but it seems like a joke. Jeremiah had a message for the people of Israel later on in the history of God's people. And Jeremiah said this, Oh my goodness, people. Destruction is right at the doorstep. The Babylonians are right here. Here's the word from God. And no one liked the word from God. The word from God was this. Don't fight them. If you, if you, if you, if you, if you just surrender to them, you'll get your life as your reward. And people are like, I'm not listening to this Jeremiah guy. That's not very patriotic, is it? No, we're going to fight those Babylonians. In fact, God would not give up this temple city to pagans like them. There's no way. And Jeremiah says, listen, don't fight them. Listen. And there was a bunch of false prophets saying, oh, peace, peace. But there was no peace. Well, they didn't like what Jeremiah was saying, warning them, the alarm going off. You know what they did with them? They threw them in a well. Let's just shut this guy up, the weeping prophet. Who Get rid of him. And of course, what happened? Was the herd right? No, they were not right. Babylonians came in and they burnt the city to the ground. You see, sometimes following the herd is not the smartest thing. Yeah, I understand a lot. Your sons-in-law think you're jesting. No one else is running. Why should we run? Jesus anticipated this. He said, there's two ways you can go by. There is a wide, 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 wide road. And on it are many, 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 many important, beautiful, celebrity, wealthy people. It is wide. And it's full of the rich and the poor and the, and the, the athlete. It's full of all kinds of people. Religious people. People who might go to church sometimes. And it's wide and there's lots of people on it. And it leads where? To destruction. But there's a small path, the path of Christ, that leads to life. And there are few that find it. And when they escaped Sodom, it was few that found it, right? It was Lot and it was his two daughters. And that's all that found the pathway. I pray you found the pathway. It's open for you. The door's wide open. You just have to go in by faith. Do you know that God loves sinners as they are, not as they should be? But He's not going to leave you as you are because He loves you. That's what He does. And so maybe those are the excuses that He heard that day. They were practical excuses. I know the theological reasons why they didn't come. But they didn't listen. You know, right now, 
the message of Christianity to Nick and Deb, Losey, is not a joke. It's reality. You pray with them and you hear what they say. That their, their faith in Christ is not just some sort of made up thing in their head. This is it. This is where faith and life hit together. And the gates of heaven begin to open, possibly, for a soul in Christ Jesus. And the angels, if we believe this, will come. <laughs> and they'll escort you through the gate. This is reality. This is not a joke. I read on Facebook this past week. Every once in a while I check. I know I'm not on there very often, but I do check sometimes. I usually see pictures of my grandchildren on there, but other than that, I see other things as well. This guy named Mike Benedict posted something by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I thought, that's a good quote. And I liked it too, it was a good, it was a good quote. It went something like this. There is nothing standing between you and the full pardon of your sins. There's nothing. There's nothing standing between you and the full pardon of sins except for your unbelief. That's all. If you can shake that off, Spurgeon says, you shall march triumphantly out of Sodom into glory. Let me add to that. It's not your income, and it's not your education that keeps you from that. It's your unbelief. It's not your ethnicity, or your people group, or your language group. It's your unbelief that keeps you from that. It's not your intelligence, or the challenges you face, and the cognitive world that you live in. It's your unbelief. It's not your height, or it's your weight, or your looks. It's your unbelief. It's not your personality, and it's not your popularity. It's your unbelief. And it's not your failures, and it's not your foes. What's keeping you is your unbelief. It's that simple. To call and believe. And ask for his help. And these words will no longer seem like we're just jesting. They'll become truth in your heart. I pray that's true of you today. That this will be true of you forever and ever. Let's pray. God, thanks for the word. Help us now, God, in your presence, through Jesus, your Son, that you will work in our souls, we pray. Create faith in the heart of who needs to be created and strengthen that faith that's already there in others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.